said God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well, hi there and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. As we continue on, actually as we come to a conclusion of our study in the seven, the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's conclusion. The conclusion, I'm, I, Lord willing, okay. It's been, it's been a, a good study, a profitable study, and it's all good things. Absolutely. Have to come to an end. There's an appointed time for everything. So we're just glad that you can be with us, join us. As yes, I do once again <clears throat> want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself. Amen. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off our last session. We were in verses, we're in chapter 3. We're looking at the church, the letter to the church at Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And we're in chapter 3, and last week we were in verses 20 and went into 21. And we didn't complete 21. So that's what we're going to pick up in this session. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark to ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together in His Word. Oh Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come together. Mm. And Lord, just please give anything that we need or can use to help somebody else in our minds and spirits. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, equip us. Yes. That's the purpose, you know, to be equipped. The God's word is profitable. It's profitable for your reproof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for training in righteousness. Yes. And it, is, it equips us to do the work of service. Uh, so we just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise and use our weakness, Lord, to perfect your, to, to, to demonstrate your power. Okay, as I said, we're, we're picking up where we left off in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. And as we start, I'm going to ask Alice if she'll just read that verse for us. Okay. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. All righty. Last, we ended uh, in our last session talking about overcoming. Uh, we spent a good deal of time on that. And again, if you've missed that or any other one of these sessions, the previous 29 sessions in this study, they're all available on Bible Talk and will remain available on Bible Talk. So th there it is. Go, go watch them, re-watch them, invite others to watch them. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to pick up where we actually left off. This is Jesus speaking to the church, right, mm -hmm. in a letter through the Apostle John to, to the church on, at Laodicea, but not only to the church at Laodicea, the, the letters are written to be heard by the bond servants of Jesus Christ, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he says that if we overcome, we will sit down with him. He said, sit down with me on my throne. You know, let, let's just look at God's plan from the very beginning. In Genesis 1.26, it says, that, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, mm -hmm. after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I just read from, that's Genesis 1.26, and I read from the English Standard Version. You know, the, what I, my normal Bible that I use is the New American Standard. Mm -hmm. And where here it said God's plan was to let man have dominion. The New American Standard translates the Hebrew word rada as rule. Let them rule over it, okay? So we're talking about a throne. We're talking about a place that from which emanates mm -hmm. dominion and rule, right? Right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit, just uh, briefly, about ownership, stewardship, and possession, okay? Those are the, st the three states of relationship with anything that exists, basically, okay? Right. Somebody owns it. Um, somebody has stewardship responsibility over it, and somebody has possession. Now, that can work in all different kinds of combinations. And I always use the example that a few years back, 
Uh, Alice and I lived in a condominium that was owned by a brother who lived up north, mm -hmm. uh, up in upstate New York. And we managed a couple of other condos for him mm -hmm. that were there. So we had, now this brother, his name was John, owned all three of these condominiums, mm -hmm. right? He was the owner. Yes. I was given stewardship over all three. Mm -hmm. And I was given possession of one for our use. Right. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So there are three states of our relationship with a thing. The thing in this case being a condominium. Mm -hmm. Okay? At no point did I own them. No. But it, for the entire time that I was working with John on that, I had responsibility. I had stewardship. I was responsible for watching over them. Right? Maintaining them. Yeah. In a sense, I had dominion. And rule over them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I had possession of one, but two other families had possession over the other two. Correct. So there you see a, a real split. Okay, mm -hmm. John had the ownership. I had stewardship over all three, and three of us had possession, possession of the three different different things. Mm -hmm. That's the way God had intended it. God never intended for man to own. Mm -hmm. When He placed them in the garden. And gave him dominion over everything that he had created. He didn't give him ownership. You know, it says that God spoke through David years later and said that the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. Mm -hmm. Psalm 24 verse 1, right? So the Lord maintains ownership. Mm -hmm. But he gave stewardship, rule, dominion over his creation mm -hmm. to the man, to Adam. Right. And that, that was supposed to extend... Just to, to Adam, the woman, and all of their future offspring. That was the destiny for man, mm -hmm. was to have that, that stewardship and, and possession. Yes. Right? That's where they lived, right? Right, right? Over God's creation. If you don't have ownership of something, you can't give something away. If I go out and rent a car from Avis or Hertz or any one of those places, you, right? you can't give the car to me. No. <laughs> I, can't give, I can't give the car away no. because I don't own it. That's right. right. While I have that car... That rental company still owns it, mm -hmm. but I have possession of it, and I have responsibility for it, so I have stewardship and possession, possession. okay? Mm -hmm. And if you've ever rented a car, you know that that possession means that you can't even let somebody else use it right. unless that has been included in the agreement with the That's owner, right. okay? <clears throat> but I certainly can't turn around and sell that car. I mm -hmm. can't give it away because it is not mine to do so. Absolutely. And this is the problem. This is what happened in the garden. Yes. Because basically, when Adam sinned, mm -hmm. he transferred, he gave away what was rightfully his, that stewardship and possession, to the enemy, That's to the right. serpent. All right? right? And he's taking it for a joyride. That's why it says now, and this is the, the Apostle John writing in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So this is after the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension, after the day of Pentecost. Okay? He says in 1 John 5, 19, that we know that this present world is in the power of the evil one. Yes. Because man trans gave it to him. Mm -hmm. Not lawfully, not illegally. And that's why Jesus is coming back to take re retake what is rightfully his. Okay? Take possession back. Take possession back. Because it was never a legal transfer. But it was indeed a transfer. Mm -hmm. The same way, let me go back to that analogy. If I have a rental car and I give it to somebody else to use it. You know what? They're going to have possession of it. Mm -hmm. So Satan has, in a sense, the possession of this world because it was given it to him by Adam, who rightfully had it. Okay. More importantly than than Adam surrendering the the place, Adam surrendered himself. I was just going to say, yeah, because we don't even own ourselves. That's why Jesus says, "You are either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. A slave of righteousness or a slave of sin." Mm -hmm. Okay. So by doing this, by entering into sin, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. He, he put himself in bondage. He gave up his, his own right to himself. So that's why mankind needed to have a redeemer. Because Adam was put into bondage to Satan. Because he willfully sinned. And by the way, if you willfully sin, this is what you're doing. But Jesus is the Redeemer. So while the earth itself 
is still in the power, the grip of the evil one, the grip of the enemy, we the redeemed, and we are the redeemed and we should say so, right? Yes. The redeemed, we've been freed from that because the curse of Adam is not carried down to you because you changed fathers. Right. That's why Jesus said, he said to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3. 3. So when you're born again, you, are, you're, you have a new father and you are that curse, that sin, that bondage of sin that came down from generation to generation through Adam and his descendants is broken in our lives. So all of the redeemed are restored to belong to God. Right. To belong to God, okay? Right. Yeah, he owns us. Remember, he not only not only is the earth his, but all who dwell on it, right? Mm -hmm. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. <clears throat> so you, you, you are God's possession. Yes. That's what he says in Isaiah 43, you are a prized possession, right? And more than just God's possession, now, so Paul would write, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8, 16. Right? And reading on in that, in that letter to the Romans, he goes on and says, the Spirit himself, let me say that again, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, <coughs> heirs, also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Romans 8, 16 and 17. So that is, if as Jesus said, we overcome, if we endure, we are joint heirs. So if we are overcomers, where this verse started, right. then we get to sit with him on the throne. We're joint heirs. We're the children, right? James said, James wrote, okay, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? James 2, 5. And, and Paul, basically, I mean, he's confirming that. You want to see two people that are in agreement, much to some people's consternation, Paul and James. Paul said, it's a trustworthy statement. For if we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure we will also reign with him. Okay? What a promise. But th it all brings it back to why this is what it means to sit on the throne with him. Yes. We are heirs to that kingdom. We are heirs to, to this, to bring back to that place, like God intended in the first place, mm -hmm. that we would have dominion, that we would rule. Yes. Okay? Heirs, dominion, rule, sit with him on the throne. But what does all of that mean at the end of the day? Write this down. I don't have a clue. I don't, I, and I'm not going to speculate. I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of things in the Word that I don't have a, an understanding of yet. But I, I praise God because I know that they are there and I will understand when the time comes. As Solomon said, there's an appointed time for everything. I don't really know what it means to rule with Him. Okay? And I'm perfectly comfortable with that. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but you'll get this. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't, don't have cares about tomorrow. Today has enough cares of its own. I just want to concentrate on walking with the Lord and being faithful to Him today. And, you know, if I am, if I'm faithful in the little things, when it comes time, He will explain to me yes. and show me what I'm supposed to be doing when I have dominion over something. And as the closer we get to his coming, there are things that he will make more us. and more clear. Right. Absolutely. You know, I'm going to go back to something else that Paul said. He said, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Love him all right? That's right. So there are, there are things God has prepared for you, for us, mm -hmm. that 
that we haven't seen. He has told us these things are going to happen. But you know what? It's in a, it's in a, it's in a realm that we don't yet fully understand. So just rest in the Lord and rejoice that you, you have a knowledge that you are a joint heir with Christ. If indeed the Spirit of God bears witness that you are a child of God. And if you have overcome and if you have endured. When Paul wrote those words that I just wrote, he didn't actually write them. When Paul wrote those words that I just read, <laughs> I, was, I was mulling that. <laughs> okay. I want to tell you that he was specifically talking, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I know. I know love by this. For while I was yet a sinner, Jesus Christ died for me, took my place on that cross. I know Christ and him crucified. You know, the word of God is filled with paradox. Mm -hmm. As is apparent par paradox. A, a well, paradox. apparent. <laughs> yeah, paradox. A paradoxi. Okay. When you're poor, then you're rich. Yes. When you're weak, then you're strong. When you die to yourself, you live forever. Okay? Yeah. Well, it's true. Yeah. Like I said, apparent right. paradoxes. So, but to me, this is kind of one of those paradoxes. We're going to sit on the throne. Mm. I'm going to bow before him. Mm. Yes. We're going to rule. I'm going to so. confess that he is Lord. That he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay, so I don't fully understand that, but I'm fully comfortable with it, and I'm fully looking forward to it. So I say, even so, come, come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to be the boss. I shared with you last, in our last session, that when I got saved, one of the last things on the day that I got saved, I heard the voice of Jesus say to me, you've had your life, now it's mine. I, I am happy with that. Yes. I am happy with that. On my desk, I have a little wooden plaque. You know, one of these titles that has my name. It looks very, very formidable. Alan W. McDaniel, Jr. C-E-M-M-I-C-O-A-E. -E. Yes. I had to put the initials because it couldn't fit the whole thing on that wooden. <laughs> Otherwise, and, it would have been as long as this table. And you've been asked, what is that? Yes. Chief Executive Muckety Muck in charge of almost everything. Now, because that's what the flesh wants to be. Mm -hmm. The flesh wants, the pride wants to be exalted. All right? God is calling us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. You know what? He will exalt us if we humble ourselves. Yes. We don't have to work at it. We don't have to figure it out. He'll take care of that. I am perfectly comfortable to trust in God's love for me expressed in Jesus Christ. Which letter in there is most important? The A. Almost. Almost. Everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Some people try to say, I'm in charge of everything. Well, the point is, I don't want to be charged for anything. Yeah. You know, it says in Proverbs 3, that not to lean on your own understanding. When you think you're in charge, you're everything is based on your understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay? What you can figure out. I, I enjoy, and I don't know, you know, I was not like this before I was saved. I promise you that's a truth. I, I enjoy being able to trust in somebody who I know to be much smarter than me, mm -hmm. who has much greater knowledge than I, mm -hmm. who has much greater understanding, who knows not only the beginning and where we are right now, but he knows the end of the matter, and that is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So what a comfort it is to be a disciple <clears throat> and, and receive instructions as they are needed. And not have to figure it out for myself. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. So what I want to do is, I, that's why we come into God's word and pray that he opens the eyes of our, our heart. That he would give us understanding of what we need to understand right now. And he will. He is faithful. It says in James, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely to all men. Mm -hmm. He will give you that wisdom. He will give you the understanding that you need. He will not withhold any good thing. It says in Romans 8, go back to Paul's letter to Romans. If, if God the Father would give His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, what good thing would He withhold from us? Nothing. Nothing. So 
Don't get bound up in trying to speculate. Don't get bound up in conjecture about what you're going to be doing, you know, way up then. It'll take care of itself. Yes. You take care of today. Yes. You be faithful in the little things. The Lord will take care of the rest. Absolutely. Amen. Okay? Okay. Okay? Okie dokie. You okay with that? If you're not, write to <laughs> Jesus at heaven.org. Make all your complaints. Not to me. By the way, I don't really suggest that you make complaints to God. <laughs> no. You know what happened to the murmurers and the complainers? Yeah. Me? So why don't you just praise him and thank him That's right. that he's got the whole thing under control? Amen. Okay. So let's move right along. Revelation 3, 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. I think we talked a little bit about this because, well, you know, Every letter, so every letter, all seven of the le letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. Same as 3, 6. <laughs> every, every one of them. All the letters carry the same admonition at the end of the letter. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm -hmm. And if you missed it last week, really go back and, and review the study from last week. Because it really, really is a good presentation of this whole concept of hearing the voice of Jesus, yes. who was standing outside the door of the church of Laodicea and knocking mm -hmm. and speaking to them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We are the bond servants, because remember that the whole book of Revelation is written to the bond servants of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 1, check it out. Mm -hmm. We are to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to all the church, yes. all right? But pray that you never hear yes. Jesus Christ say to you what he said to these church-going folk in the, uh, here in the city of Laodicea. Pray that you never hear that. Yes. Because you're lukewarm. Because you say you're rich and have need of nothing. I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's the word of God. Yes. Pray that you never hear that said to you. You know, there are a lot of things in the word of God that are written for you, but are not written to you. Not everything in the Word is written to you. And when you gain a certain amount of spiritual maturity to understand that, it will set you free from a lot of bad teaching. Amen. It's the truth. <clears throat> it's the truth. Yes. You know, I'll go back again in Romans, the letter to Romans. Oh, what a wonderful letter that is where Paul said, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Amen. Romans 15, 4. Everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is written for our instruction. It's all written for us. Not all of it is written to us. What Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, may he never say to any of us. Mm -hmm. May he never have cause to say to any of us. There's a lot in the word that he said that you don't want to hear him say to you. Mm -hmm. But we need to learn from it. Yes. Okay? We need to be instructed. We need to be instructed by what Jesus was saying to these people gathered in, a, in a, the assembly at Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to be like them. Now, not because we're better than them, but because we have chosen to be obedient. And to obey is better than to sacrifice. I'll tell you what. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right? So now, the real question becomes here that as we reach the conclusion of our study of the seven churches, of the church, the real question becomes, do we hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? That's the real question. I mean, you know, this study is not just to, to occupy time. There's a purpose to any, uh, any of these studies that we do here at Bible Talk and as many other faithful brothers and sisters are doing. There's purpose to it. 
that we might grow in the Lord, that we might come closer to Him, that we might be more like Him, that we might be more obedient to Him, that we might be walking more in that righteousness, all right? But listen to what the Lord spoke through the prophet Zechariah. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears from hearing. They made their hearts like flint so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. And just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. At Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Think about that. Mm. Because they were stubborn and stopped their ears from hearing. Their hearts were like flint, so they couldn't hear the law and the words which God and the Spirit was speaking to them. So, hearts of stone. It says, therefore, great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. You know, I'm going to go back to Romans one more time. One of the things, Paul says we are saved from the wrath of God. When we're looking at the church of Laodicea, if that's the last church of the, you know, the last picture of a quote-unquote formal church here on earth before the great tribulation, what follows then? The great tribulation. Mm -hmm. A great wrath from the Lord of hosts. If you're not listening to the Spirit of God, if you aren't hearing Him, if you're not choosing to hear Him, if you turn a hard heart, you're destined for wrath. Yikes. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can deal with that any way you want, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Because the Word of God is true. Do we hear the Lord telling us what pleases Him yes. and what displeases Him as we look at what He said to these seven churches? Okay. You know, I've mentioned before that back, I think, in 91 or 92, Alice and I and another couple dear friends and a brother and sister started a ministry called the M.D. Solomon Company. It's the M.D. Solomon Institute today, uh, which was a, a seminar that I had created primarily for business. business. All right? It was originally called Biblical Principles for Success in, in business, in the workplace. Now, I actually had to change that title mm -hmm. because after doing a couple of seminars, I realized success. that when I use the word success to Christians, I mean, you can ask 100 Christians what success means to them, and you'll get 110 different answers. All right. So actually, we turned. We I've changed the title of that seminar today to uh, Biblical Principles for Personal and Professional Growth. All right, but it all comes straight from the Word. What is then a reasonable definition of success? I mean, you ask somebody in the world; they're going to talk. They're going to tell you about their goals. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to have a better job, a bigger house, a nicer car. I mean, that to them represents success. But I said. And I will say again today that the only true measure of success for a Christian is that when you come face to face with the risen Christ Jesus, that you hear him say these words to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, 21. Does that not sound like it ties in with these verses? Mm -hmm. Because yes. you were faithful in little things, yes. I'll put you in charge of many things. Mm -hmm. Have we heard the Lord telling us what pleases Him and what displeases Him? Let me just run through this very quickly. I mean, it's been 30 weeks or 30, 30 studies. And, Summarize right? it. The things that were pleasing to the Lord. And listen, just you, you can take your own time and go back without listening to 30 hours of study. But just go through. 
those two chapters of the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, and see if this is not true. Here's what was pleasing to God. When he said, you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles. Revelation 2.2. 2. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Revelation 2.3. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Revelation 2.6. You hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Revelation 2.13 Your love and faith and service and perseverance and your deeds of late are greater than at first. Revelation 2.19 You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Revelation 3.8 You have kept the word of my perseverance. Revelation 3.10 do you get a picture of a thread that runs through all of these churches whom God commended? It has to do with keeping his word, yes. keeping his name. And by the way, in Revelation 19, his name is the word. To persevere. It is about your relationship with him who was the word made flesh who dwelt among us. The things that were displeasing. And by the way, that's basically all the things that he said to the churches that are pleasing to him. Now, there's other, a lot of other statements that are encouragement and so forth. But these are the things that he specifically says pleases him. The things that displease him. But I have this against you. That if you've left your first love, Revelations 2.4. You have some who hold the teaching of Balaam, Revelation 2.14. You also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans, Revelation 2.15. I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, Revelation 2.20. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead, Revelation 3.1. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, Revelation 3.15. You say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Revelation 3.17. Do you see a thread? The false teachers. The false apostles. The false prophets. What do they do? They disconnect you from the word. The sound doctrine of the word of God. Because here. I'm going to say this. And I think this is the most important part. Of this entire message is what is important in these perilous last days is that we know and have a right relationship and trust the Word of God. Amen. It's the Word of God. And I will tell you that right now there is such an incredible attack on the Word, yes. okay, within the church and outside the church. It, it boggles the mind. And what truly boggles the mind is how either unaware of this the church seems to be, how accepting to it. But the very first revelation of the serpent, this devil, that old Satan, was that he was more subtle, more crafty than any other beast of the yes. field. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you that, that so many, all of the, the proliferation of, transliter of translations of the Bible, you will see, if you go to publisher sites, that so many of those things are made to make it easier to understand. You know what I was saying? That was never God's purpose. Mm -hmm. He sent the Spirit to lead you into all truth. The, the disciples, the apostles, couldn't understand it sometimes. They said to Jesus, why do you speak to these people? Always, you're always speaking to them in parables. Mm -hmm. He said, because it's been given to you to understand. Right. He's not trying to make it so simple. It's never, you're never going to get the Word of God without that connection to the Holy Spirit of God. That's right. You're never going to have the power to understand it because somebody wrote it easier. A lot of the translations that are out there today, I'm going to tell you, there are some translations that I will say, and I'm not going to tell you which ones. I'm, they're, they're from the pits of hell. That's right. They are perversions because they change what God said. That's right. They change what God said. Now, I, we, could do, we could do days, hours, months of Bible studies. I've done a couple of Bible studies on some of the worst translations. Mm -hmm. 
But you know what? I trust that if you have a right relationship with the Holy Spirit and it's in your heart to be protected from that, that the Spirit of God will lead you in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. But you have to you have to have a concern. You have to have that willingness to know the truth, and you have to abide in His Word. I'm going to tell you so much of what I see as Christian media today, whether it's television, the new movies coming out, all these Bible movies, they subtly change what God said. If they change what God said, no matter how pretty they are, no matter how Christian they look, no matter how religious they look, they are from the devil. It's an optical it, illusion. It, it's an optical illusion. If you want to know about optical illusions, go look at our Bible Bite on the, on the Bible Talk website. Go to Bible right. Bites and look up optical illusion. The optical illusion. And you will see how easy it is mm. to be deceived when you operate by your own understanding and your own eyeballs. That's right. We are living in the perilous last days, and there's a great and grave attack going on in the body of Christ. And no, I'm not talking about what ISIS is doing to Christians and what is going on and in in so much with radical Muslims. That's not what I'm talking about. Is that an attack? Yes. But Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. All they can do is phew, send you there closer. I have said that so many times. Now, that may, that may be harsh. That may sound harsh. But if you understand God's love and if you understand God's word, I pray that this will get to your spirit. I have done so many pastors conferences where I go in and teach pastors. And I've gone in over and over and over. And I've said to large groups of pastors, how many of you here believe that God wants to bless you as much as he possibly can? And I have never said that where it failed that every hand in a room shoots straight up into the air. And I, and I say to him, I say, and I, I say in the truth and love, mm. I say, well, you're going to repent of that before I get through with you. Because here's the truth. If God wanted to bless you as much as he possibly could right now, you'd either drop dead of a heart attack or a, a nuke would hit you on the head from whether it comes from New Jersey or North Korea, I don't know where, but, and you would go fizz straight to the throne of God. Because the word of God says to live is Christ, to die is gain. So the only reason why we're here is for others. The only reason we are here is indeed for others. That we would be a faithful witness to the power of God, to the love of God, to the word of God. That we would bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Because we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. We, are, we have a ministry of reconciliation. We are here not for... Listen, it's not about heaven's, heaven's better than this. Oh, mercy. I wrote a book. You, you can go on our Bible Talk website again and look at it. It's called The Master's Call. As a matter of fact, the three of us were involved in this because we were all living down in Central America as missionaries, living out in the bush. Mm. Uh, this is going back quite a number of years. And Alice and I had been in a city, in the main city in the country, getting supplies one night. And on the way back out, I stopped to help somebody. And I got out of my truck. And I was hit by a speeding semi truck there on this lonely road out in the, out in the jungle, right? Mm -hmm. I was hit by a semi truck that was doing about 50, 60 miles an hour. There were two fellows in the truck. They were killed on the spot. They were both they both died there that night. They found out that they were Christians. Yeah. I'm here. One of the first things when I finally got back to a hospital in the United States, because I was in a hospital down there for a few days, and they did their very best to kill me, but were unable, because God said I was going to live. The very first thing when I got to the hospital, I was up in Tampa, Florida. Mm -hmm. I, they rushed me into the emergency room, and a doctor came running over, and he looked at me and examined me. He said, this is a miracle. And I said, I know. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is really a miracle. I said, I know. I got to the point where I think he wanted to hit me, because I... You know, because you agreed with him. Well, because I was so calm. About it. I was so calm about it because I knew there was a miracle. I mean, you don't get hit by a truck doing 50 miles an hour. You're on foot. And have the and, damage. And I have shared that testimony yes. around the world. Yes. And people say to me, "Oh, how blessed you are! What, what a miracle!" I said, well, yeah, "It is a miracle." But you want to know something? If he hadn't saved me that night, I'd be someplace much better than where I am right now. But he had a purpose. He had a purpose. His purpose, not That's my right. purpose. Yeah. I didn't say, oh, Lord, keep me here because I want to do this before I, oh, Lord, keep me here because I haven't finished. I want to do this. I, no. 
It was his choice, and he yeah. chose to keep me here because he had a purpose. That's right. Remember what I said? You've had your life, now it's mine. That's what he said to me. And then he said to you when you were laying there, are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. I said, yes to the Lord. And he said, not, not now. now. <laughs> All right. So I don't want to get too distracted. But the point is that we are here, not for ourselves. We are here to serve the Lord God Almighty. And we serve him by letting him who has chosen us to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the living God, to touch other lives. Your life is not about you. Your life is about the people that God puts you in contact with. Amen. And if you've received anything out of this study for 30 weeks, I want you to know that it should be this, that you need to hold fast to his word, to hold fast to his name, and that you need to share that love of God that he has poured into your heart through his Holy Spirit with the people you come in contact with. The love of God is demonstrated, the love of the Father is demonstrated in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul came to the place, and I want to tell you something, I don't think there was anybody who knew more, no normal man that knew more about the love of God than the Apostle Paul. And he said, I have determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. Mm. Because that is the demonstration, the display of God the Father's love. You not only need to tell people about Jesus, you need to tell people about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So many times, and you know, I, I, I think I've shared this before with you, we go around and I'll go into, Alice and I'll go into a grocery store I go against my better judgment, now. but I go into the grocery store with Alice. And as we're checking out, I've said to so many people, they ask me, you know, how are you? People say, how are you to you all? Yeah. Well, I know something, I'll tell you a secret. They don't really care as a rule, but it's an opening. Yes. Opportunity. So, opportunity. So somebody will say to me, how are you? And I'll say, I'm eternal. I'm going to live forever because of what Jesus Christ did for me on a little hill outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. I, what I want to proclaim is what I am because Christ died for me on a cross. And when I share that with people, people say to me, what? I mean, that's a typical reaction, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. And then I'll explain, yes. what? Yes. That not only did he die for me, but he died for mm -hmm. you. And if you want peace in your life, no Christ, no Jesus, no peace. He himself is our peace. That's right. If you want the truth in this day when you can't trust anything out there, no Jesus, no truth. He said, I am the truth. If you want to find the way, Jesus said, I am the way. No Jesus, you're going to wander aimlessly around this wilderness. If you want hope. You want hope. You need Jesus Christ in your life. Exactly. That's the message that God has us on this planet to share with others. We need to encourage one another today, as long as it's still called today. But we need to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all that we meet. Mm -hmm. We need to go into all the world and make disciples. Hey, that's the deal. That's the deal. And I pray. I mean, we're, we, I, you've probably gotten the idea if you spend any time with us with these studies. We're not too formal about this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to put on a religious collar and start talking, you know, good religious King Jamesy. I'm just, I'm just going to share what's on my heart. I'm going to share what God has put on my heart. And what's on my heart is a love of God and a love of his word. So I pray that that's contagious. I pray that we all grow in our love of God Amen. and that our, we grow in our desire to be pleasing to him. Amen. What else is there? There's nothing else. So, Except Father, Jesus. I pray that you create in us a clean heart, Lord yes. God. You. That you, unite, you would unite our hearts to fear your name. Lord God, that you would touch us. And, Lord, we would be filled with that zeal. We wouldn't be wishy-washy. We wouldn't be neither hot nor cold. But we would be filled with a jealous zeal for you. That if we've left that first love that we had when we first met, that we would return, Lord God that we would kindle afresh the gift that you've put in us, Lord God, that stir up those flames. 
that like Moses at that burning bush, you would create a fire in us, Lord, that you who are a consuming fire would be visible in our lives so that men would be attracted to find out what's going on. Let them come and ask us, why are we different? That we might proclaim because of you, Lord. Let us stand with all that we meet who are unsaved and say, he stands at the door of your heart and knocks. And he's calling you out. Let us say to a church that's gone wishy-washy, cold, compromise. Let us say to that church, come out from their midst and be separate. Return to your first love. Lord, I, I pray that you would use our lives for the glory of your name. And I rejoice that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. And that you perfect power in weakness. We praise you and thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you for this Bible study that we've had. And I pray, Lord God, that it would be a seed planted within us. That would blossom and bear fruit, Lord. And that fruit would be that we would be passionate to grow more and more pleasing to you day by day. That we would, like the church at Philadelphia, look for the doors of opportunity that you open before us. That we would just have that love expressed in our love for others. I praise you and thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that concludes this Bible study. That's the end of this study of this Letters to the Seven Churches of Revelation. We will start something new. We don't know yet what. Soon. <laughs> He's got a week. So we'll, we'll be back. And we'll be back. What I can tell you is, you know what? If you have any ideas, any suggestions, write to us. Office at BibleTalk.com. We welcome your comments, your suggestions. Okay? Uh, we want to hear from you. In the meantime, we'll be praying to see what, what the Lord would have us do. We want to be led by the Spirit of God. But until then, we, as we go, I want you to know that Alice wants you to know. Jesus loves you. A lot. God bless you and goodbye until next time. May you be used for the glory of his name. Amen. Until next time. Bye-bye.